The Buddha didn't say that life is suffering, but there is a lot of suffering in life. Birth, aging, illness, and death, being separated from those we love, having to stay with things we don't love, don't like, not getting what we want. There's a lot of pain in life. This is why the Buddha is teaching us such, such a gift. He spent 45 years telling people how they could learn not to suffer in spite of all the, the pains and difficulties and separations in life. So it's appropriate that we receive his teachings with gratitude. As he points out, when we're suffering, on the one hand we're bewildered, and two, we're looking for someone to show us a way out. That's one of our first questions. Is there someone who knows a way out of this suffering? The most primal question in the mind. Even before we know words, that's a question that gets formed as we suffer as children. Can somebody help? And so the Buddha, after all those many lifetimes of trying to find awakening, saw that this was the best use of his time. To show people how they're causing themselves to suffer and what they can do to change that so they don't have to suffer, even though there is birth, aging, illness, death, separation, all the things we don't like about life. It is possible to experience these things and not suffer. That's the essence of the skill that he taught. And it is important to see it as a skill. He said there were basically two teachings he taught. One was the fact that unskillful behavior should be abandoned, skillful behavior should be developed. That's an activity right there. He didn't just say, this is skillful, this is unskillful. But he went on to say, okay, this is what you should do if you want to put it into suffering. You should learn how to see where you're doing things that are unskillful, saying things that are unskillful, thinking things that are unskillful. Learn how to give that up. Replace it with more skillful behavior. The other categorical teachings, the Four Noble Truths, which he has you look directly at the problem of suffering, what's causing it, what can be done about it. And for each of the truths, there's a skill. You want to comprehend the suffering so you can see what's causing it. When you see what's causing it, then you can let it go. You want to develop the path so you can realize the end of suffering. Those are all skills that have to be mastered. And it's so easy to get those tasks mixed up. We see something we don't like and we try to push it away, push it away. Either that or we feed on our suffering. and actually develop our suffering. In other words, we got the wrong, the wrong tasks. You want to look at how you're suffering so you understand exactly what's going on. On the one hand, there's a simple pain in the fact that things change. But that pain doesn't have to make inroads into the mind. There's something about the mind that takes it in feeds on it, and then gets sick. That's what the Buddha's teachings on clinging are all about. Clinging is a kind of feeding. We keep feeding on these different activities, hoping they're going to give us some sort of satisfaction. And it's like 
having a poisonous food. You say, well, if I fix it this way, it's not good. How about I fix it in another way? How about another way? And we just keep trying all these different ways of fixing that poisonous food in hopes that it's not going to poison us. And it turns out there's no way you're going to fix it. The one way you can fix it where it's not going to poison you is to turn things into the path. That way of fixing your food is going to strengthen you to the point where you don't need to feed anymore. This is an important point. They talk about comprehension as being the, the duty with regard to suffering. In another passage where the Buddha defines comprehension as developing dispassion. In other words, you understand it so thoroughly that you've decided you don't want to eat, on, eat it anymore. You don't want to feed on it anymore. But the mind has to be strong before it can stop its feeding, otherwise it just keeps going back to its old ways. So you take these aggregates, you take the events of life, you try to turn them into the path so you can gain that strength. And particularly the strength of con Mindfulness, the strength of concentration, the strength of discernment. These are the things that enable the mind to stick with a path and to work with it and develop it. Because the discernment is not just the discernment that comes at the end of the path when you finally realize, oh, I've been feeding on this stuff and it's not nourishing at all and I don't need it. Prior to that time, you have to have the discernment that motivates you to want to work on the path. And that takes a lot of wisdom right there. I was reading today someone saying, that, well, you know, the Buddha and the Pali Canon, we don't really know if that's the true Buddha. Can't really trust it. Well, how would we know about the Buddha if we didn't have the Pali Canon? And how are we going to know whether we can trust it or not unless we try the teachings? Because that's what the teachings are all about. If they help put an end to suffering, then it's genuine Dharma. The thing is that they require an awful lot. You have to be generous. You have to be virtuous. Lots of things you have to give up. Lots of things you have to do. So if you decide beforehand, well, I know all about this, I can't trust those, we can't trust those texts, we'll just pretend that they're not there, treat them as stories, and leave them at that. That's basically an excuse not to put them to the test. Of course, everyone is free to do that, but the question is, are you missing out on something important? You look around and how many teachings are there that really promise to put an end to suffer in a way that's, that makes sense. So this is one of the reasons why we have the reflection on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as one of the ways of giving strength to the mind, motivating you on the path. Here's a teaching that says it's within your capability to put an end to suffering. This is how you do it. And you have the example of many people who've put these teachings to the test and found that they pass the test. So there's a lot of wisdom in learning how to motivate yourself on the path, keep yourself on the path, keep going on the path. So even though the mind is still feeding, it's feeding something good. It's learning how to take those aggregates and feed them on, on them in a way, <coughs> feed on them in a way that's not poisonous. It's like that blowfish they have in Japan, where if you take out certain organs, it's not going to be poisonous. The thing is that the cooks that are really considered 
skillful cooks are the ones who leave a little bit of the poison in, so you get a little bit of numbness on your lips. So you have the thrill of getting a little bit close, close to death. But that's not the way the Buddha taught it. If you were, if you were a cook of the blowfish, he'd leave that organ out entirely. Say, look, this is the safe way you practice. You feed on the aggregates, you get the mind into concentration. In order to do that, you have to gain a sense, kind of a hands-on sense of how you relate to form, how you relate to feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness. Because these are the things that are the raw materials for getting the mind to be concentrated, getting to stay there. Focusing on the breath requires a sense of the form of the body from within, how your body feels when you're sitting here with your eyes closed, how you inhabit it. And then there's the perception, the mental label that keeps you there. Metal fabrications that direct your thinking to the breath and evaluate the breath, work with the breath. If you notice there are fabrications that go off someplace else, you have to learn how to say no to them and how to avoid them whenever possible. And then there are feelings that come as a result of the breathing. There are the parts of the body that are in pain that maybe sometimes the breath can't help, and there are the parts that are really comfortable, feel really refreshing, full, satisfying. These are the things that you deal with when you're bringing the mind into concentration. So it's getting the mind concentrated is what, what gives you hands-on experience and distinguishing among these aggregates and learning how to feed on them in a skillful way. So you really do strengthen the mind. And you avoid the poison that comes when you really cling. Identify them as you or yours. And as you find the mind going off to feed in other directions, when there's a really good, strong sense of concentration, you will realize, wait a minute, I don't need to feed that way. This doesn't really get anything gain anything and have any worth. It's not worth the effort. Because remember, it's not just feeding, you have to fix the food. So why fix poison for yourself? And this is how you begin to develop this passion for things that used to hold a lot of interest for you, the things that you used to like to fix and then like to eat. either simply for the pure pleasure of it or sometimes out of a sense of obligation or all kinds of reasons we have. For justifying that kind of effort and ignoring the pain and suffering that it causes. But it's when you finally willing to look at it for what it is and see, okay, I've got something better here. There's a better way of feeding that doesn't have all that poison. And when it really hits you that there's nothing to be gained by that poisonous eating, then you learn how to let it go. And it's only when you've let go of a lot of your other attachments that you start looking at the process of the path itself and begin to realize, well, this too involves a lot of fixing of food. And there comes a point where you say, have you had enough? And this requires that you learn how to fix it really well and the mind be really strong so it finally is willing to let go and stop that kind of feeding, to realize, okay, I don't need any more of that kind of nourishment. That's when nibida, which you can translate as disenchantment or distaste, basically the sense of, okay, you've had enough of that feeding. And when you no longer want to feed on it, then you begin to ask yourself, do I want to fix that kind of food? 
That's why the cessation follows on dispassion, the cessation of fixing the food to begin with. If you're not going to eat it, why spend all that time in the kitchen? That's when you can let go. And that's when you're really free. But even before you reach that point, you use the skills and insights you gain from concentration, from seeing feelings and perceptions and fabrications in the ways in which they create all kinds of trouble, or in which you create all kinds of trouble around them. You can start seeing how they function in your daily life as you deal with other people, as you deal with birth, aging, illness, death, separation. And you begin to see some of your feeding habits for what they are, that they're really unhealthy. This is not easy, because we have a lot of attachment to them, to these habits. But as we stick with the path, we begin to reach that point where something in the mind says, enough. And there's a sense of freedom that can come with that. It's amazing how the mind resists that freedom, which is why we have to keep at the practice again and again and again. But it's only through the practice that we get to the point where you can finally admit to ourselves, okay, I've had enough of that. I thought it was clever, I thought it was good, I thought it was whatever you used to justify it all these activities to yourself. And then you can finally let them go. So work on strengthening the mind as much as you can. Learn how to feed on the aggregates in a way where you don't have to get poisoned by them. And you find that even just being on the path, you see a lot of the ordinary suffering of life just falling away, falling away. The path doesn't save all of its good things for the end. There's a lot of good in staying on the path. Sometimes it's difficult, but and the longer you see that it really is good. And if you're really sensitive, you see that there is suffering falling away while you're staying on the path. You're avoiding a lot of ways that you could create trouble for yourself, for the people around you. It's a good path to be on.